I'd like to very much thank Jo Nova for all the heroic efforts that she does. Um, it's, we're, we're told from the other side that the science is settled because they just want to shut down the debate. There's nobody in Australia that could go head to head with Jo and, and beat her. And I'm guessing that Jo doesn't get flooded with um, government grants. Um, and this is what is happening on the other side. There is so much money sloshing around. And I think the, uh, the final point Joe made about you know, how they don't want to solve it, I think a, a massive factor in this thing is the crony capitalists. Uh, they are making a ton of money. I reckon you know, these, these teals that are very, very well funded, uh, there's just a lot of people making money out of, the, out of this scam, out of this fake science. So I did want to, um, Tofa's asked me to, to speak about what, uh, what would be the solution to this. Well, the libertarian solution is usually very straightforward, and I'll just spell that out to you. We believe that there should be a separation between the state and the energy market. We believe it should be a free market energy system. And if the government just 100% got out of it, uh, and, and we let the true private sector, the true capitalists, say, look, you can make money out of this, uh, you know, let, let, let's have a free-for-all. So under that situation, we would have coal, we'd have nuclear, we'd have hydro, and maybe we would have uh, some renewables. And, and, and if people want to con uh, continue to claim that the CO2 is going to destroy humanity, well then, <clears throat> under this model, what, if people really believe it, they can run a public relations campaign and they can say, look, don't use fossil fuel energy, pay more money, um, and use uh, the renewable energy, okay? And now, look, if it's true, if the world is really going to come to an end, then, then that, that is what we would do. And, these, and, and then <clears throat> we would have a much, much stronger economy. Now, you know what has happened? When, when I grew up in the, 70s, in, in the 80s and the 90s, this country and most of the Western world used to have 3 4% economic growth per year. We'd have a recession every sort of five, six years, and a recession's a good thing. Cleans out, the, uh, cleans out the economy. Some businesses which are, uh, are maybe on the wrong path, uh, track will, will go out of business. But we used to have good 3 4% economic growth a year. Now, what, what is that? I know that sounds like a boring statistic. That means new businesses are starting, people are getting better, better paid jobs, better careers, families are starting, the country's got stronger national defence. GDP is very important. This country has been in a... Uh, a recession for about 20 years since the, since the global warming stuff stuffed up our energy because energy is the foundation of everything that we do. Now, they've, now we, they say that we have 1, 1, 1, 2 percent economic growth a year. That's just keeping up with the population. So that on a per capita, we, we've just been stagnant for a long time and more than anything else, I put it down to the energy market, the, the, med, the meddlers, the central planning meddlers uh, making everything more expensive. It's not just the electricity price. It flows through to absolutely everything and it's holding us back in a big way. Now, the, the people that are, the very small group of people that are making a ton of money out of it, you know, they want to keep this thing going at a million miles an hour. So there's the crony capitalists and then there is the politicians who have these, this messiah-like complex. Now, I have been in the New South Wales Parliament for coming up to just just, just uh, the, the one-year anniversary is just coming up. People ask me, what's it like? And I say, look, the thing that has surprised me the most, and look, I've been believing in Joe Nova's science, you know, for, for, since Al Gore came along with it, you had know, 20 years ago. So I've always been a, a global boiling sceptic, but I have still been very, very surprised about how almost every piece of legislation has to be seen through the pr prism of uh, climate change. Global boiling, should be called, of course. And they are obsessed with it. And it's not just the Greens and the Labor Party, the Liberal Party. Uh, you know, you know the, the two sort of great right-wing conservative leaders this country's had in the last generation is John Howard and Tony Abbott. They brought in more of this stuff uh, than anybody. Now, the, the Labor comes along and they've laid the foundations for a lot of this stuff. And, I don't, and I, neither of them believe in it. We know that because J Tony Abbott has given some magnificent speeches about this on this subject after he was the Prime Minister. They're absolutely magnificent, but I'm sorry, Tony, it was a bit too late. Now, John Howard went along with it when we had the big hoopla when, when Al Gore was winning Nobel Prizes and Academy Awards. Uh, this was in 2006, 2007, when Howard was coming to the end. 
and you know he was he wanted to win and you know it had been a long-term government governments change in a democracy from time to time and in all this hoopla about climate change John Howard went along with it okay pushed pushed by a up, up and coming cabinet minister of course uh, Malcolm Turnbull but we know that John Howard do doesn't believe in it because you know in Kevin Rudd's very boring memoirs uh, there's one very interesting part in it. He talks about the day that he moved into the lodge. And as you would imagine, the lodge had been, the Howards had been there for 12 years. The cleaners came in and impeccably cleaned everything they possibly could and got it ready for the new occupants. Being you know, one Prime Minister to another Prime Minister, you would have had the best, the best cleaners, etc., in Australia doing the job. But Kevin Rudd writes in his memoirs that they, the Howards accidentally left one thing behind. And you, when you think about it, it would be something that would be quite easy to forget, and that is there was a DVD in the DVD player. That would be something you could overlook if you were going to clean something out. So Kevin Rudd opens the DVD player, and what have the Howards been watching? The great global warming swindle, OK? <laughs> so they'd been sitting there watching it. I'm sure they agreed, I'm sure the Howards agreed with everything, but I'm sorry, in office they were weak. So we do need... Uh, you know, uh, political parties to come out and make the case that the science is not settled. Now, the politicians who are just obsessive with this stuff, uh, <clears throat> it, it really reminds me of the central planners. Uh, this, this, is, this is, you know, most politicians have this view in their head. They're not motivated by money. They're motivated by being remembered by history as sort of the, the, the great figure that saved the world. They want to be like Winston Churchill at the helm, saving the world. And, uh, <clears throat> of course, you know, we had, um, you know, we had a lot of communism in the 20th century, 100 million deaths. Now, 30 million of those 100 million deaths was in China in the late 50s, the Great Famine. 30 million deaths. We barely know about it. Uh, I mean, it's not disputed. Even the Chinese government admits that it happened. Uh, but we don't know about it uh, like we know about, say, the, the Holocaust, because in Germany there were a lot of uh, video cameras. So when the Allies and the Soviets came in, they, could, they said, look at this, OK. But we barely have any video footage or photos of the Great Famine. And, uh, but 30 million is a lot of people dying, and, and they all died in about one year. Now, how did that happen? Well, we had Mao Zedong, is, is there, it comes to power in 1949, and by, not, by the late 50s, he sort of, you know, fully got fully in control of China, massive China. And he's never grown any crops in his life. But up, up there in Beijing, he's like the new Chinese emperor. He issues this decree about how to plant rice, OK? He's saying it had to be, you know, uh, a certain, you know, uh, a, a couple of inches apart or something in the soil. And that decree uh, had to be followed across all of China. Now, the, 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 the rice farmers of China, obviously for thousands of years, knew how to grow their own rice. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and it would, be, it would obviously differ from region to region in China. Some, sometimes you're going to plant the rice seeds close together, sometimes you're going to give it more space. The farmers know how to do it because they're at the local level. They know what they're doing. But no, 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 Mao comes and says, no, 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 this is how we're going to grow rice. Okay, this is a guy, you know, of course, never been a farmer. And if you disobeyed Mao's uh, instructions from on high, well, you know, you'd get punished to death. So that all the farmers did it, and surprise, surprise, there was a massive food shortage, and people just simply starved to death. Now, that, that is an extreme example of, of central planning, but this is what most politicians have got it in their head, that they, that they are smarter than the people. The libertarians believe in localism. The closer decisions are made uh, to the people, to the people who are actually affected by it, the better we will be. Now, what's happening across New South Wales right now is we've got these things called the RES, the R-E-Z, Renewable Energy Zones. So our central planners at Macquarie Street have designated five uh, areas of New South Wales where they are just walking in there with a tonne of money and they are going to build these wind, wind, wind farms and solar farms and... Uh, and huge transmission lines. And they are going into these farmers, and I'm going out to Dubbo soon. D Dubbo's, you know, the, the Central West uh, uh, Renewable Energy Zone. There's an enormous amount of farmers very upset. The government walks in and offers a tonne of money, an absolute tonne of money, but, you know, it's, it's wrecking these uh, farms that have been around for many generations. 
And it's not, it's, it's central planning on a mass scale. And I recently asked the, the energy minister, <coughs> Penny Sharp, I said, look, is there any jurisdiction in the world where uh, we, are, we are looking to for inspiration here, who we can say have done this renewable energy transition well? Of course I knew the answer was no. There, there's no way, they can't say it's worked in California or Germany or anywhere else. And she said, she basically said, oh no, well we're all, it's, it's a sort of, a, you know, it's an experiment, we're all doing it at the same time. Well, they've been experimenting for a long time and it's, uh, <laughs> all we can hope is that people start to listen to people like Joe Nova and, um, and we, we can, I, I, I truly believe that the, the way to win this war is to cut the head off the snake and that is the science. The science is fake science. And I'll tell you who the, um, the person who uh, first coined the term global warming in the late 1950s was Professor Roger Revell. Now, he was a brilliant scientist, and it's an extremely interesting story, and his life intersects with Al Gore. But Roger Revelle in the 1950s helped organise this global um, uh, scientific experiment to measure what's happening to the CO2. Industrialisation is increasing CO2, and people had been speculating for about 100 years, well, you know, is all this industrialisation going to warm the planet? Roger Revelle dedicated most of his life to understanding the actual science of this. And when he first did those studies in the late 1950s, he was somewhat alarmed. And, and then, but, but he said, he's, he always said, we need so much more research into this. And so he, he, he died in 1991, but between the late 1950s and 1991, Roger Revell, who everybody in the global warming debate acknowledges was a brilliant scientist, <clears throat> His level of confidence in the science kept decreasing with time. He, and he said by his last, his last essay that he ever wrote, he said, global warming, look before you leap. It was written in 1991. <clears throat> now, by this stage, a character by the name of Al Gore had come along. And Gore, Gore didn't study science. He studied politics and history. He didn't know the first thing about science, but what he did do... He said, well, look, all I'm doing is I'm just telling the world what Roger Revelle has been saying. And that's where, that's where he gets his credibility from. It's in his books, it's in his movies. He says, oh, look, I'm just, I'm just the, the communicator of Roger Revelle's ideas. But Roger Revelle barely had ever met Gore, and Roger Revelle became very, very alarmed. But by this stage, he was a very, very old man. And, and when, it, when Roger Revelle came out and said in 1991, he said, look, the more we study this, the less confidence we have I am still, he said, it still needs to be studied, but I'm very concerned about these apocalyptic uh, claims which Al Gore was making at the time. And so Gore basically came out and said, oh, look, he's gone senile, OK? And that was absolute garbage. But anyway, I hinted at it last night. I think there's a movie being made in Hollywood later this year, uh, and I think it will go into that Roger Revell story, and I think you'll all find it very, very interesting. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you.